Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and another video. Today I'm going to be doing another watercolour painting, as after experimenting a bit with acrylics lately, I've realised just how much I've missed my watercolours. And in this video I'll be showing you a simple technique I use to make painting realistic hair or fur a lot easier. I'm also really excited to be painting the first page in this new A4 watercolour sketchbook from Etcher, which contains 100% cotton cold press paper, so I hope you enjoy the video. If you'd like to see my first impressions and review on this sketchbook, I do have a video where I reviewed the smaller A5 version of it, and I'll put a link to that video at the end of this one if you want to go and give it a watch. Needless to say though, I was really impressed and loved it so much that I ordered this larger size. I found a lovely reference photo on Pixabay for today's painting, and I've printed it out here to show you. I'll also put a link for it down in the description box below this video, along with a list of all my materials. Now, as you may know, if you watch my videos, I love a good art challenge, and last week, because I was doing my Animal Artist Collective piece, I missed out on taking part in Dina Tollefson's Red Rover Art Challenge. I'll leave a link to Dina's channel below too. The challenge this time was to either paint something red or a dog, so this dog portrait should do nicely. I started out by first drawing an accurate outline sketch in my sketchbook using a regular HB pencil. Painting fur or hair can sometimes seem a bit tricky, so to simplify the whole painting process, I'm going to start with an underpainting. For this, I'm using a very dilute layer of Venetian red, which will help me to map out some of the lightest and darkest areas before adding in any details. It's by no means the only way to begin a watercolour painting, but I find it really useful in helping you to get started, especially if you're painting hair or fur, or perhaps attempting something a bit more challenging. I'm painting onto dry paper to begin with because as much as I love painting wet on wet, for this step I want to map out the different tonal areas of the portrait into defined sections. If I was painting on wet paper, the paint would spread out into the water and all blend together. So an underpainting is really just an initial layer of paint that acts as a base for subsequent layers. They are often used to define colour values for later on in the painting, but I'm also using it here to help me show the length and direction of fur growth on the dog's ear, and define more clearly the main features of the portrait, like the eyes, nose and mouth. With that done and completely dry, I then begin adding in the darkest values, starting with the dog's eye. I used sepia around the outside edge of the eye and added some ultramarine blue to the lower half of the eye, which will help it to look really bright and shiny. Then I used a more concentrated mix of dark sepia and Payne's grey for the darkest part of the eyelids. And you can see close up that I've also left the white of the paper for the highlight. Next, I used the same sepia grey mix to define the outside edge of the nose, following the guidelines from my initial underpainting. Moving down the face and onto the dog's mouth next, and I'm starting off with burnt sienna. I already know the area I have to paint in from my underpainting, so I can concentrate more on the length and direction of fur here. I use short brush strokes and flick up at the end of each stroke to give the hair a more realistic look. For the next part of the painting, I'm going to work on the dog's face, and first fill in the darkest part, which is the area here where the ear casts a dark shadow. I'm using more burnt sienna and applying it quite loosely onto dry paper. Having the underpainting here also helps me to work quite quickly, and whilst the paper is still wet, I also drop in some burnt umber, and let it mix together on the paper. I do the same for the darker area of fur around the eye and muzzle. And soften any harsh paint edges I don't want with a clean damp brush. For the rest of the face and mouth, I use a more dilute mixture of burnt sienna, but I'm still applying my paint onto dry paper. The guidelines from the initial underpainting are still visible at this stage, and will help me to add details in the right place as I paint the next layers. Here I decided to soften the edges of the fur on this ear, so just rub gently at the paint edge with a clean damp brush. Now this first layer is dry, I can go in with my next layer and start to add in a bit more detail. I'm using burnt umber this time to mark in the darker area of fur where the whiskers will be. 
I'm also adding a layer of burnt umber to the darker shadow area here too, again applying the paint to dry paper, and working gradually inwards towards the eye. Then I add more burnt umber over the fur around the mouth, using the paint more as a glaze to gradually build up the colour I want. Now on my reference photo, the ear on the other side of the dog's head is facing the light, so casting more of an orange glow to this area under his chin. So I switch back to my burnt sienna to build on the brighter tones here. Under the neck I also use sepia to paint part of the collar, in case you are wondering what this bit is. Ok, so with the main features of the face mapped out, it's really just a case of repeating the same steps until you've built up the tones and values that you need, and as long as you let each layer dry before adding the next one, and you have a decent quality paper, this shouldn't be too much of a problem. This 100% cotton sketchbook really stands up well to adding multiple layers of paint, and I took advantage of this by adding several glazes to help bring my dog portrait to life. As I built up the layers though, it was easy to see that I needed to go in and adjust the values on the eyes and nose, so I added more concentrated paint to the nostrils and the top of the nose. and then darkened up the eye as well to help it to really stand out. I added a bit of indigo to my Payne's Grey under the highlight and some more concentrated sepia grey mix around the outside edge of the eye and on the eyelid. And as often happens when you darken up one area, you then need to go back and darken up another so I added a final darker layer of paint to the shadow area. If you're unsure of how to judge your values when working in colour, you can simply take a picture of it and convert it to black and white, which will help you to more easily see where you might need to make those adjustments. Ok, so once I was happy with how the face was looking, it was time to move on to the ear in the front. As you can see from the reference picture at the top left of the screen, there are no really bright white highlights on this ear, so I began by applying a wash of dilute burnt sienna, pretty much to the whole area. As with the face, the underpainting is still visible through the first layer, and will help me to fairly accurately paint in the darkest and lightest sections of fur, and give me a guide as to the fur length and direction too. With that first layer dry, I can then go in and add more concentrated paint, still burnt sienna here, and start to work on each section or clump of fur. Again, I try to lift my brush at the end of each stroke to give the strands of fur a tapered end and help them to look more natural. And within each clump of fur, I try to build up the layers gradually to get a variety of tones which will add interest and depth to my painting. It's also important when painting hair or fur to make sure that you add some flyaway strands to help it look less uniform and more natural. And unless you're going for a really smooth look, it's also important to wait for each layer of paint to dry before adding the next, which is why I tend to move around a bit. Now I'm moving down the neck, and there is a real contrast of values here. There is the really bright, almost orange part where the sun is shining through the fur, and there is also an area that is nearly white, and getting this contrast right will really help the painting to pop. At this stage it's starting to come together, but before I go in and add any last details, I like to take a step back and look at the painting as a whole, to see if there are any more adjustments that need to be made. I decide that my darkest values still aren't dark enough, so go back over these areas again with some more glazes. Watercolour does tend to dry lighter, so what may have looked really dark when you first put the paint down may have dried lighter, without you even realising it. So it really is worth taking that step back, having a break maybe, and looking at the painting with fresh eyes to be able to see what's going on. It can mean the difference between a painting that may be good but look a bit flat, to one that really pops off the page. 
I'm using much more concentrated glazes now, but it's such a quick and easy way to change up the tone of your piece. I'm still working on dry paper, but I can soften any paint edges out using a clean damp brush. So the layer underneath is dry, so it won't be disturbed when I add the glaze on top, and as long as I only use a damp brush, softening the paint edges shouldn't disturb those underneath layers either. You don't want big puddles of water though, as this may seep into the paper and cause unwanted blooms. Here you can see how quick, easy and effective adding a glaze is. I'm also going to add one last layer to the nose and eyes to balance out the contrast. And with the darker fur on the face, I'll just add a few darker strands of hair on this ear too. This did improve things, but I still thought that the ear in the foreground here needed to be a bit brighter, so I added yet another layer of burnt sienna. It can seem a bit repetitive, but it's worth spending a bit more time on it, and I was pleased I did. So now I'm much happier with this level of contrast and the painting is dry, so I'm going to add in a pop of colour for the background. And for this I'm going to use the wet on wet technique, so I wet up my paper before adding in paint. I drop in some ultramarine blue as I really like how the blue complements the orangey burnt sienna. I also wanted the background to be a lot looser and fade out to nothing, as I thought it would contrast well with the more detailed features on the dog's face. To get the blended out to nothing effect, I use my clean damp brush along the edge of the paint, which softens out any harsh edges that may form as the paper dries. For the lower part of the paper, I decided to use indigo instead, just to add a bit of interest, and I quite like how it turned out. Now I'm going to add in some whiskers, and for this I'm using Dr. PH Martin's Bleed Proof White Ink and a small rigger brush. I add in a few black whiskers too. And finally to finish off, I used a peach coloured pencil to add some fine flyaway hairs over the top of the ear and pull out some of the lighter areas. I could have used the bleed proof white again, but the flyaway hairs weren't pure white here, so I went for the coloured pencil instead. This step may not have been entirely necessary, but I'm quite pleased with how it turned out overall. Let me know what you think in the comments box below and let me know your thoughts as well on what you think of using an underpainting in watercolour paintings. Do you think it's helpful or do you think it makes the painting process too controlled and less spontaneous? Personally I think it's a really helpful tool and meant I could really relax and enjoy the painting process today. So a big thank you to Dina Tollefson for another great challenge and a big thank you to all of you for watching. If you like the video, please give it a big thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon as well to be notified as soon as I upload a new video. Also, don't forget to go and check out the other artists who've taken part in the challenge on Dina's channel. So that's all for today, guys. Have a great weekend, take care, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.